Hello. Welcome to rounds this day, the first rounds of 2024. Um, I'm Gillian and I'll go ahead and get started. And hopefully I've done all the things that I needed to do to get started. <laughs> all right. Okay, so the first case is a dog. Uh, there's no gross photo, um, sad trombone. I found this by doing a, uh, an image search and I was like, whoever made this is an idiot because that's not a trombone, that's a trumpet, <laughs> possibly a coronet. I'm not sure it's a little bit of a deformed trumpet if it is one, but anyway. Um, so the first case is a dog and the gross uh, impression was not exciting enough to uh, take a gross photo. So I will read the history and then we'll jump into the histology. So it's kind of a complicated uh, history, but I'll go ahead and get started here. Um, this is a 10 year old neutered male Australian cattle dog, which in my mind, cattle dogs either have uh, zonular ligament dysplasia and lens luxation or goniodysgenesis, sometimes both, uh, but this is neither of those. So anyway, so the history we got was um, diagnosed with severe retinal and optic nerve degeneration in both eyes in 2018, so quite a while ago. They had actually tested for um, progressive rod cone dystrophy version of progressive retinal atrophy, and the dog was negative for whatever gene mutation uh, is responsible for that variety of PRA. Um, and so currently, uh, the dog has mild diffuse conjunctival hyperemia, diffuse moderate corneal edema and fibrosis, arborizing 360 degree corneal vascularization, and a cataract, uh, previously identified retinal degeneration, which they suspect was inherited. Um, and let's see here. Um, this dog had actually had a little um, conjunctival squamous cell carcinoma removed in 2020 with clean margins. Um, carcinoma in situ actually, uh, which we had received, I believe. Um, and then let's see here, uveitis of unknown etiology in 2021 in the left eye only, which is the one that we received. And then a cataract a little bit after, or in 2023. So chronic corneal ulcer with corneal edema uh, was treated with linear grid in July of 2023, uh, healed in August, um, and then chronic epiphora conjunctival hyperemia since that time. So kind of a complicated history, uh, but kind of a, a neat set of histological lesions. So here, I'll go ahead and get that slide up here. Um, to be honest, the subgross is pretty boring. I can show it, maybe. And now I have to, oh, why did it do that? It went away. Oh, wait, hang on. I have to click this. Okay, there we go. I am technologically challenged, I fully admit. All right, so here is the globe. This is the subgross view. Uh, here's the cornea. Uh, there's the iris. We did not sample the pupil in this section. The lens is uh, posteriorly displaced kind of artifactually. Uh, we did make a note that the vitreous was liquefied grossly, so a little bit of vitreal degeneration. And then uh, there's the optic nerve right there. Um, so what you might be able to tell is that there's not a whole lot of retinal layering happening on this side of the um, fundus. Uh, when we go over here, the retinal layering picks up again. I know it's not very clear for all you right now, uh, but it's also, the ret retina is also much, uh, it's identifiable right here, but it's quite atrophied because you can't see the layering. Um, and then the gonios, extra gonio slice was about the same. So really kind of fairly boring on the subgross view. So, uh, and even at 2x, it's still going to be kind of boring. So uh, I think actually we'll just skip right to the higher mag stuff. Maybe I can get it into focus even. There we go. Now I'll have to get it into focus again. Okay. So uh, the corneal epithelium is hyperplastic. Um, and it is very minimally keratinized. You can see it has an undulating um, contour with the corneal stroma, which is probably consistent with the, whatever they called it, I've never heard that term before, linear grid. So I think sort of a grid keratotomy kind of thing, um, probably to try to help heal a chronic ulcer. Um, and then here's another area where it kind of dives deeper, a little bit deeper into the stroma there. 
And then the stroma itself is a little bit disorganized. Uh, the, the stromal collagen is a little bit dense and maybe more eosinophilic here in the superficial area than in the deeper area. And then as you can see, it's quite vascularized. So we've got some corneal epithelial changes, some stromal vascularization and fibrosis. Um, it kind of goes along with this dog's chronic history of corneal stuff. Um, and oh, and by the way, they actually reported no glaucoma. That was kind of an important bit of information that I should have told you at the initial bit. Um, so as we move back into the anterior chamber and anterior segment, um, there's quite a bit of um, lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate in the uvea. So we've got a mild to moderate uh, lymphoplasmacytic anterior uveitis. It's actually quite plasma cell rich uh, when we go higher mag. Um, so consistent with a fairly chronic kind of smoldering uh, uveitis. Um, those cells also occupy the trabecular meshwork. Um, we don't really have much in the way of membrane formation on the front of the iris, but once again, they never reported glaucoma, so that was less of an issue. Uh, as we go back to the lens, the lens is actually artifactually flipped around, so we're looking at the posterior lens capsule here, and we've got, um, there we go, wow, you have to really adjust, it's really kind of annoying. Uh, we've got little bits of uh, posterior lens capsule wrinkling, it's very cute right there. Um, with some posterior migration and fibrous metaplasia of the lens epithelium. Fibrous metaplasia, and because it's lining the posterior lens capsule, posterior migration of the lens epithelium, which are hallmarks of cataract, cataractous degeneration. Um, and then the real meat and potatoes is what happens going, well, what's, what's going on at the back of the eye. So to give you some reference, here's our optic nerve. The optic nerve head is a little bit atrophied. Um, but when we look at um, where uh, the choroid is here in relation to the optic nerve, it's actually not that sunken. It's maybe a little bit atrophied, um, which is consistent with their um, with them not reporting glaucoma. Um, this is the dorsal side. And if we look really hard, we might find the tapetum. So as I pointed out at low mag, um, so here is tapetum. So we know that we are in the dorsal fundus now. The retina on this side of the optic nerve and sort of um, almost to the, uh, anyway, it was atrophied right next to the optic nerve dorsally. But here we are a little bit further away and we can see all of the retinal layers. We've got retinal ganglion cells. We've got the inner nuclear layer, the outer nuclear layer, the photoreceptor inner and outer segments are all present. Um, the choroid itself is pretty boring. As we move a little bit closer to the optic nerve, and also I should point out, here's RPE cells. Let's go higher mag. There we go. Here are RPE cells, um, and in the tapetal fundus, uh, do not contain melanin to allow that nice reflection. Um, and then as we move a little bit closer to the optic nerve, all of a sudden those RPE cells disappear. And then also concurrent with that, let's put that in the center, Dillian, come on. Um, concurrent with that disappearance of the RPE cells um, is uh, kind of abrupt atrophy of the outer nuclear layer. And as we get closer to the optic nerve, it actually tends to be a little bit more full thickness retinal atrophy. Here's a few plasma cells in the retina, but very few, very little inflammation. And then I'm just gonna go back to lower mag and zip across to the other side. So that's pretty, gets a little bit more significant the closer we get to the optic nerve. And then when we zip to the other side, uh, we've got some important things that are happening here. First of all, the retina is almost completely un unidentifiable. The choroid has lost almost all of its pigmentation. And also it's quite, um, has a little bit more collagen in it or the appearance is that it has more collagen. It's possible that it has the same amount of collagen it did before this weird atrophy and that without all of the melanocytes and um, open blood vessels, uh, it just looks like it's fibrotic. So it's hard to say, but uh, we typically do refer to this as fibrosis. Uh, this is one of the very rare instances that we um, diagnose uh, choroidal fibrosis. Um, so, so, and then also what we have, there's no identifiable, identifiable retinal pigmented epithelium no real identifiable choroidal melanocytes. And then the retina itself is just toast. <laughs> There's just nothing left. 
when we do go higher mag, you can see that there are a few um, inflammatory cells and a few plasma cells here and there. Um, but this is sort of uh, the most significant uh, lesion of this case. Um, so to recap, we have um, profound retinal atrophy, ventral retinal atrophy with choroidal fibrosis and loss of RPE. Um, and as you can see, it also extended a little bit dorsal to the optic nerve. Um, so this pattern, to my knowledge, is not really consistent with an inherited retinal degeneration. For the most part, um, and the, retinal the progressive retinal atrophy in dogs, which is a very heterogeneous set of diseases because it's associated with a whole bunch of different mutations in retina important genes. Um, while the degeneration does uh, vary in um, how quickly it progresses and its onset, its age of onset, usually after a couple of years of having it, there's almost no outer retinal, uh, like outer retina left. So the photoreceptors pretty much are atrophied after a couple of years. And this is a 10 year old dog diagnosed five years ago at age of five. Um, with this retinal, retinal degeneration. Um, so anyway, um, and as I pointed out, uh, we still have plenty of remaining um, photoreceptors dorsally there. They did not actually ever say whether this dog was blind, um, but I assume there was some visual issues. So... Anyway, let's go back to the PowerPoint. So this is consistent with um, a disease that we call working dog retinopathy, um, which Dr. D, um, so here, here are our most important diagnoses for this case. Um, so working dog retinopathy and choreo retinopathy was described, oh gosh, I don't know, quite a while ago, probably 20 years ago or more. Uh, by Dr. Debielzig and some folks from New Zealand who found this, this set of lesions in, I think, a group of dogs that lived in outdoor kennels. Um, and the working theory at that point, was it New Zealand or somewhere in Scandinavia? Now I can't remember. Wow. Vastly different uh, geographic locations. But anyway, um, anyway, the, the theory was that um, these were working dogs that had probably been exposed um, and been infected with uh, GI parasites that um, led to fibrosis, that led to larval migrans to the eye that then resulted in this uh, variety of fibrosis. I can't remember my, any of the details, and of course, I should have read them before I presented this case. But anyway, so we see this occasionally. It's usually bilateral. So this dog, it was, this dog is reported to have bilateral retinal degeneration. Um, and I can't think of anything else to say about it. It's sort of an interesting, fairly, like quite rare uh, diagnosis and set of lesions that we see. Um, so I can't think of anything else. Um, I can't remember how often or if evidence of actual larvae in the choroid, for example, were ever found. Um, I don't remember the specifics. Uh, so anyway, um, that is all I have to say about that case. So let's move on. Um, if I had Zoom open, I could be looking for... Uh, questions in the chat, but I don't at the moment. I will open it up once I'm done presenting and try to answer things. Okay, next up is um, uh, the left eye from a six-year-old French bulldog, spayed female. Um, the history we got was very nice and concise. They say full thickness, corneal laceration, uh, historic dog fight 24 hours prior to presentation. Uh, from the 11 to 7 o'clock position with uh, potential invasion into the sclera. They're, they're talking about the laceration. Suspect aqueous leakage, hyphema, unable to view the intraocular structures, uh, complete retinal detachment view on ocular ultrasound. So, um, and the dog also has reported KCS in the other eye, so it was a pre-existing problem. Um, so uh, we get a lot of globes where we suspect trauma, uh, and a very, very small subset of those eyes actually have reported trauma. Um, so this one's interesting that it's not only reported, presumably witnessed, but also we know exactly what the etiology was. So this was a dog fight. So presumably a tooth did this, I would guess. 
Um, and so that kind of trauma has elements of both penetrating trauma and as well as blunt trauma. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the lesions that we see um, with those different types of trauma. Anyway, so here's the globe. The cornea itself is all diffusely kind of cloudy. Um, it's actually a little bit pigmented on the surface here. And remember the dog had KCS reported in its other eye. Um, here's that laceration. It is a full thickness defect right through the cornea. Um, here's the iris on one side. Here's the iris on the other side. Um, you can see there's some hemorrhage and some exudates in the anterior chamber that kind of slips up into that defect. Um, one thing that's uh, conspicuously absent is the lens. So we never found any evidence of lens in this eye. Presumably it was extruded through the corneal laceration. Uh, the retina is indeed detached as they suspected via ultrasound. Um, and there's a bunch of hemorrhage and other exudates uh, in the vitreal space that's now compressed. And then uh, probably in the subretinal space was um, some fluid um, that poured out when we cut it. Um, well, that's about all I'm seeing uh, in the gross photo here. So let's go ahead and jump into the uh, histology. Do the subgross thing here. Get it into focus. Better. So there's the cornea. Um, I know things are a bit fuzzy. They don't focus very well doing this. There's that laceration site, so a full thickness defect. Um, and remember, this is 24 hours prior to a, nu a nucleation. So this is a uh, basically an acute uh, set of lesions that we're seeing here. Here's the iris. It's sort of uh, jumbled up. You can't see uh, all of its structures very well, especially when it's not in focus. Um, and then uh, here we've got some of that uh, hemorrhagic exudates in the, um, well, there's some of it in the anterior chamber. Here's in the posterior chamber. There's the iris leaflet on the other side. Um, you can see the trabecular meshwork is a little bit expanded, more than usual there. Um, and then the retina is detached, as we said, and we'll look in a little bit more detail at some of the retinal lesions. Um, and then back here is the optic nerve, which was uh, fairly um, boring. So let's go back to the front. So to go along with the dog's KCS, which I suspect was bilateral, the corneal epithelium is a little bit hyperplastic and it is pigmented. Oh gosh, flip the thing. Oop, there we go. It's, so it's a little bit hyperplastic and somewhere in here, there's some pigment. I can't remember exactly where it is, but let's slide on up to that defect. There's, there's some more obvious epithelial pigmentation and also the uh, superficial stroma is vascularized there and has a little bit of inflammation. So some of the inflammation is probably neutrophilic and it's directly associated with this laceration. But knowing the history of KCS, it could be a little bit more chronic inflammation as well. So um, as far as an acute lesion goes, uh, we have some epithelial migration over that blunt end of the corneal stroma. So that can start happening a couple hours after an ulcerated area is develop develops. Um, and then um, per the acuteness of this lesion, there is not really much in the way of limbal vascularization. So that there hasn't had time to develop stromal vascularization at this point. Um, there is some nice acute um, fibrin and a lot of red blood cells in the anterior chamber. Some of this is probably some uveal tissue that kind of got sucked up into that um, defect. Um, there's little bits of um, pigmented uveal cells in here, like right in the center there. I think those are some uveal cells, but they might also be neutrophils. And that's another component of what we're seeing here is um, neutrophils. So there's dotted around a lot of neutrophils and some of them do contain melanin. So it's possible that those are just melanin laden phagocytes. Um, one interesting feature, as I mentioned, that uh, dog, well, dog bite trauma is both blunt and penetrating. So blunt trauma typically will lead to peripheral breaks in Desmase membrane. And so what we have here Here is one end of Desmase membrane here, and here's another end of Desmase membrane. So we've got a peripheral break on Desmase membrane. It, that is present at both sides of the globe. Um, so that's consistent with blunt trauma. And then also 
incidentally, I think this little Frenchie is also goniodysgenic. So we have that. The end of Decimase is actually kind of arborizing and attached directly to a pretty thick slab of iris tissue there. And that is true on the other side too. So this is incidental finding this dog did not have glaucoma prior to this or at the time of nucleation. Uh, but anyway, so there's another peripheral break in Decimase and actually the gonio isn't quite as convincing on this side, I didn't think. Uh, but anyway, okay. So let's move back a little bit. Um, as I said, the lens was not present. So that's consistent with aphakia. This is a cover slip scratch. So just ignore that. It's kind of cool looking, but um, anyway, so then we have um, the retina is de diffusely detached and kind of fragmented. And so you can kind of see where we lose, there's disruption of some of the retinal layers. And you have to remember that the retina is kind of, and I just bumped it. I don't know where we ended up. The retina is sort of like a, um, not very cohesive uh, tissue because there's not a whole lot of, there's no collagen in it. So there's nothing, nothing to really help it keep its structure, uh, especially with concussive forces like blunt trauma. So um, that blunt trauma can lead to retinal detachment and sort of fragmentation and then early necrosis. So um, if we look a little bit higher here, the, the necrosis is probably not going to be super obvious right here, but we definitely have some leakage of fibrin from retinal blood vessels. Um, and so some early, some early probably ischemic changes that we're seeing in the retina, in addition to the actual physical trauma, the force of being detached and fragmented. And then let's see, what else do we have going on here? Um, in some of these areas of the uvea, I think it was actually better on the other side. Um, you kind of start to lose some of that crispness of the iridociliary epithelium, especially the pigmented epithelium. And that is consistent with necrosis as well. So this um, type of necrosis is probably ischemic um, related to blood supply disruption associated with the blunt trauma somehow. Um, and or it could be, at, once again, sort of that direct blunt concussive force leading to trauma, or I mean, uh, necrosis. Um, here's a little bit of um, the, the supracordial space is expanded by clear space with some hemorrhage. And so um, that is consistent with uh, expulsive supracoroidal hemorrhage and edema, uh, which occurs when there's a fairly sudden drop in intraocular pressure, i.e. when the cornea is uh, breached. And so that is um, actually all of the lesions of this case. So kind of an interesting one. Um, I kind of have a tendency to not think trauma is very exciting, but actually I do think it's kind of cool in the end um, when you think about all the things that can occur um, with the different types of trauma. So there's quite a list of um, diagnoses here, uh, which I decided to leave up for this slide um, just so you can get a chance to, to look at all of them. But anyway, kind of a neat case um, of ocular trauma. Come to mama. And... Now it is someone else's turn. I think it's Megan's. So. Okay. So next up we have a cat, uh, an 11 year old neutered male uh, tuxedo cat. So probably domestic short hair cat. Um, Mm, they say previous history of ocular hypertension, not current. And then uh, there's a good number of things listed here, but uh, the main thing that I would highlight is that, that cat, this cat uh, did have a cataract develop and then went for phacal emulsification uh, with an IOL implantation in both eyes. <clears throat> and uh, then eventually this eye developed a progressive panubiitis with retinal attachment. Um, and there were some concerns for a certain thing that I will withhold. Uh, and this eye was enucleated and submitted uh, for histologic analysis. Um, so the main thing is that this eye is post, uh, post-operative phacal emulsification with IOL implantation. Um, do we know uh, We probably do. Let's see. Date of surgery for nucleation is 1130 of this year. And they did, oh, last year, right? 23 is last year now. Right. Uh, March, so between March and November of 2023, um, in terms of surgery with IOL uh, to enucleation. Um, 
So uh, we have the iris leaflets, which are um, probably uh, stuck to the anterior lens capsule uh, surface. We have the IOL in place here, which is looking uh, much flatter than a uh, sort of um, you know preoperative lens. Um, and we have this sort of white tan tissue um, that's kind of wrapping around the lens capsule and extending. Uh, what? Sorry. Maximize it. Oh, I should maximize it. Uh, Just click on. Haha, -ha, okay, that, even better. Posterior synechia, tan white tissue that's carpeting uvial surfaces, and then some of this here is detached retina. Um, and, and yeah, there's also a little bit of hemorrhage. Um, so that's the, the gross, and let's take a look at the histo. Which is already full screen, okay. All right, so here's our cornea, just to orient us. We are on the lowest magnification, and there's some goo. Better, slightly better. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a little bit of uveitis coming in uh, here with the purple in the iris, but the main event is that there's a lot of purple sort of lining surfaces inside the eye. So we have it, um, lots of cells lining the ciliary body surface, um, extending down along the inner surface of the retina here. Um, our lens capsule is not well captured in this section, but there's a little tiny piece of it. Let's try and get a little bit better focus. There's a little tiny piece of it here, which is sort of embedded into these membranes that are very cellular. Um, we have membranes sort of extending through the vitreous. Here's the other side of the globe with similar kind of very cellular membranes lining the ciliary body surface in particular. And our retina, which is detached and kind of folded with these membranes still extending along its inner surface. So just kind of an overview of the extent. Uh, there's a little bit more lens capsule uh, available here in the um, gonio slice, so an extra radial section of the remaining globe. And again, this highly cellular membrane lining the uh, surface of the lens capsular bag. There is a discontinuity in the anterior lens capsule, which is consistent with the capsulotomy sites. And now that we have that overview, let's drop in on those cells and see who they are. Medications will probably focus up a little bit better for us. So some of these cells are lymphocytes and plasma cells because there is a little bit of inflammation, but you start to see that a lot of these cells are spindle cells. And you can follow them around and onto the surface of the retina. And here on the surface of the retina are some of the more ugly cells. So we'll take a look at those closer. Whoops, bumped it. Um, probably a little bit too close. So we're looking at spindle cells admixed with a few inflammatory cells. Perhaps I was mistaken. Here we go. So some of these uh, are rather plump. There's a fair amount of pleomorphism between the nuclei. I'm pretty sure there was a spot where there was a good number of mitotic figures. Here's a rather large cell. but perhaps I was mistaken. Um, we'll also take a look at, let's start going back here. There we go, I like some of these. So again, fairly pleomorphic and, splump, and plump spindle cells add mixed with lymphocytes and plasma cells. out on the surface of the lens capsule over here. Um, so another view of those spindle cells forming a multi-layer membrane over the lens surface. Um, and then in particular, they look fairly cool uh, down here along the retina. Yeah, still a bit of lens capsule. Um, where they form sort of uh, multiple layers uh, with collagen membranes sandwiched between them. Um, 
So uh, some of these spindle cells uh, may represent um, just migrating uh, and hyperplastic lens epithelium, but some of them are pleomorphic enough and uh, with enough mitotic figures, although I didn't really show you a good feel for the mitotic figures yet, um, that they are neoplastic. Um, so this is a uh, early form of post traumatic sarcoma, most likely. Um, and uh, you can kind of see the continuity of how it um, uh, arises from the lens epithelium that has migrated outside of the lens. Um, let's see if we can. You can see this uh, additional collagen kind of laid down inside the lens capsule. Um, and maybe some of the more clearly non-neoplastic uh, lens epithelial cells that uh, were migrating posteriorly along this lens capsule. Um, so just to kind of show you that they're, the lens epithelial cells are still there. Um, as well. Uh, so that's this case. Um, I'm going to show you a PAS stain as well. So PAS highlights uh, basement membrane type collagen, this bright magenta pink, which is very nice in the lens capsule here. You can really see where the lens capsule is. Um, and it's not as good in the uh, membrane over here. But Um, it kind of really helps to highlight those alternating layers of collagen and um, lens epithelial cells. Uh, they're sort of doing their job and laying down additional basement membrane, but uh, just going too far with it. Um, so uh, that's this case. Um, Uh, so the main diagnoses are up here. Uh, this was a cat uh, with an early uh, spin post-traumatic spindle cell sarcoma, um, which developed after uh, fake emulsification with IOL implantation. Um, the caveats with cases like these, um, at Coplaw, we only ever see the most complicated surgeries ever, <laughs> because uh, of course, all of our cases are surgeries that ended in formalin fixed globes. Um, so we basically see the worst of the worst in terms of complications and have a somewhat biased view or sort of a, a sampling bias built in, in terms of uh, determining what the risks of surgery are uh, and the complication rates are. Um, so it would be interesting to me to see, for example, how this cat's other eye does and um, like clinical side data. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we certainly have a, at least a few cases with uh, fake emulsification and IOL that went on to develop post-traumatic sarcoma in cats. Um, so that's that. Um, uh, the next one is a dog. This is an eight month old male Chihuahua mixed dog. Um, and they describe conjunctiva covering a very large multi-lobulated orbital cyst with some extraocular muscle attachment. And they suspect that they see an optic nerve in there. Um, so they say that they suspect a cystic globe. Um, so uh, we'll take a look at some cool things in a young uh, dog today. Um, this picture is not an image of this actual case I'm about to show you the histology for. It is a representative gross photo from a different case that was a little bit more grossly impressive. Um, so uh, it could be what this case might have looked like uh, if it was a little bit more inflated. Um, but we have a little bit of brownish tissue here, which could be kind of uvea. Um, but most of the tissue here is occupied by this sort of um, almost multi-loculated, cavitated, um, or cyst, uh, depending on the lining that we can establish, um, space. Uh, and these can be quite fluid-filled, um, and probably there was fluid before it ran out uh, in this picture. Um, so that's the, the gross image. Um, sometimes you can see more of a well-formed globe, but uh, in this case there wasn't, and also in this representative case there wasn't. Um, pretty much just this uh, hint of uvea in the gross here. Um, so let's take a look at the histology. So when we're over here, it kind of looks like globe. Um, we have this uh, dense collagen uh, stroma, which looks like sclera. Uh, we do have uveal tissue. Um, it uh, looks like it's kind of trying to be an iris here. There's a little bit of smooth muscle that could be sort of sphincter muscle. Um, and then it looks like it's kind of trying to be 
ciliary body here. Uh, there's these little uh, short papillifers projections that look like they're kind of ciliary body plique. Um, but apart from this sort of distorted uh, uveal tissue, there's not much going on that looks overtly like globe. Um, and very quickly, it just progresses into this uh, stuff here, um, which is basically just this collagen uh, and then an inner lining of tissue uh, forming a large cystic space. So we can follow that cyst around. It's quite large and has all these uh, infoldings, a very kind of convoluted interior. Um, and you can see it on this side. Uh, so basically just a little bit of tissue that's almost globe and then a large cystic space. Um, to help orient us over here on the surface, there is conjunctival tissue. It has that uh, nice loose collagen stroma and a conjunctival epithelium as well as I can catch it. There it is, as well as probably a tangential section through a third eyelid. We have a little bit of cartilage here, and in other sections, we'll see a little bit of the third eyelid gland. Um, so this is basically what was probably the surface of this structure, um, but there's not much that is clearly a cornea here. Um, it's basically just conjunctiva, a little bit of globe-esque uh, tissue here, and then this large cyst. Um, if we drop in a little bit closer on what's going on inside, um, near this area where there's more recognizable um, sort of uvea, uh, we do have this folded up, um, basically neuroglial tissue. And if you look at some of these uh, small round cells with the deeply basophilic nuclei in particular, um, the photoreceptor cells in the outer nuclear layer will typically have this little um, clear streak through the nucleus, which is a good trick uh, if you're sort of just starting with histology and um, need to differentiate these little basophilic nuclei from other little basophilic nuclei, like lymphocyte nuclei. Um, so uh, these are photoreceptor nuclei. Um, and basically, this is a really sort of folded up and, um, you know, not well uh, organized um, retinal tissue or retinal-like tissue. Um, so that's pretty cool. And then the lining of the cyst, if we go back to where it's more just cyst with lining, I'm going to pick a different spot than that. It's sort of rubbed off there. Here we go. Um, it's also just sort of this disorganized neuroglial tissue, kind of like this. Or let's see if we can find a better area. Mm -hmm. Aha, this looks promising. Aha. Uh, or this sort of neuroepithelial uh, like lining. So we have this sort of pseudostratified columnar uh, epithelium that's kind of rep reminiscent of a reticillary epithelium. So kind of neuroglial, neuroepithelial lining um, of this large cystic cavitation. Um, you may have noticed when we were over here by the uveal tissue that uh, there are occasionally some islands of cartilage just kind of hanging out in the cyst wall as well. And if we switch to this other slide, Uh, they said that they saw an optic nerve uh, at surgery, um, and here along the lining of the cyst, uh, there's this sort of pocket of neuroglial tissue that um, extends out in these little uh, rays and then, then this giant lobule cartilage next to it, um, which could be kind of optic nerve head, um, but it's hard to confirm because everything along the cyst wall is this sort of disorganized neuroglial tissue, but maybe. And then um, another thing that kind of could be optic nerve is way back here as well. So this section, we've kind of got a little bit of a meninges around this. Um, so it could be the, the tip of the optic nerve kind of heading out. Um, and then the last cool thing to show you in the wall of this cyst should be around here. So sort of embedded in this neuroglial tissue, uh, we've got these um, globular looking pink blobs. Go uh, I'll go higher, I will. some of which have a single nucleus associated with them. And basically, if you weren't, uh, if you, you know, just dropped right in on this, it uh, would definitely remind you of bladder cells, potentially, or mergagging globules. Um, so this is uh, lenticular metaplasia, or some degree of, like, slightly lenticular uh, differentiation, um, which is kind of cool. Yeah. It's quite rare in mammalian eyes. Mm -hmm. It's much more common in traumatized uh, bird eyes. Mm -hmm. So mammalian eyes is quite rare. And it's usually yeah. something weirdly developmental like this, or uh, we've seen it in at least one horse eye that had like a medulla epithelioma. I can't remember how old that animal was, but anyway, That's yeah. Cool. 
cells that have uh, lost their differentiation instructions to some extent. Um, so that's kind of all I wanted to show you on this globe. Um, so, uh, or sort of globe, <laughs> it's globe shaped kind of. Um, so uh, the differential uh, for this was potentially a cystic globe. Uh, however, because this uh, um, structure did form basically uveal tissue, even though it's very segmental, um, like not much uh, kind of recognizable globe formed, um, this, the more appropriate diagnosis is most likely microphthalmus with cyst. Um, so the difference between microphthalmus with cyst and congenital cystic globe. Um, so microphthalmus with cyst uh, is um, theoretically a incomplete or closure or failure to close of the optic fissure. Um, and uh, basically when that fails to close, you get this sort of proliferation of neuroglial tissue that extends into this big cystic structure. It can progressively fill with fluid over time. Um, and uh, you can get uh, differences, like sometimes the, the globe is a little bit better formed or sort of more complete than this, uh, but um, that's uh, basically microphthalmus with cyst. Um, and then congenital cystic globe is uh, more likely a um, uh, inability to invaginate the optic vesicle. It doesn't invaginate uh, properly. Um, and then that will produce basically just a giant cyst lined by neuroglial type tissue um, without really uh, uveal differentiation or differentiation into globe type structures. Um, <clears throat> so in this case, uh, theoretically the more fitting diagnosis is microphthalmus with cyst and theoretically the issue here was uh, failure to, of the optic fissure to close. Um, and it's a congenital malformation. Uh, and hopefully now that this uh, cyst is out, the dog will enjoy the rest of their uh, lovely you know, time with their family um, and it will be a big deal. But um, so uh, just a really cool congenital malformation case. Um, and that's it. Uh, I will hand over floor. All right. Um, um, first up uh, is the right eye from a five-year-old shepherd mix um, that has a uh, history of uh, the, up the ophthalmologic findings uh, say, stated primary uveitis and keratitis with secondary glaucoma. Uh, the eye was non-visual. Um, they said yes to glaucoma. And they wanted to rule out uh, blastomycosis versus something immune mediated. Um, they did note that the uh, left eye had similar uh, findings. Uh, this one was just kind of an interesting case because it looked really weird uh, when we pulled the eye out of the uh, jar. Um, so this is actually the back of the eye. Uh, and there was this uh, large defect in the posterior sclera um, that kind of looked like almost like it was like torn and there was this white tissue kind of exposed. And then this, this really dark divot here, uh, which I presumed represented like optic nerve, optic nerve head area. Um, so it was really, really weird looking. Um, and then on the hemisected view, um, you can see sort of the, the back part of the eye. It's, it's kind of flat and very thickened here. Um, there's there's no lens um, but in this photo, but it was in the other half of the globe, so it just didn't um, stay in this half um, when I hemisected it. Um, but we've got the cornea up here. Um, the um, iris leaflets uh, seemed a little bit thick. Um, and then you can see some of the, the retina back here, um, a little bit kind of thick and, thick and a little bit wonky, um, kind of back where this... Um, defect area was. Um, so let's take a look at this case. Oh, it's the farthest one to the right. There you okay. Go. I think so. Oh, okay. okay. I think I'm thinking about that right. right. Nope. That's all right. I'm just, ah, here we go. Okay. There we go. All right, so cornea at the top. Um, 
Here we can see the iris again kind of thickened. Here's again that lens that I promised was there. Um, and then this really kind of thick eosinophilic um, flatness and kind of defect here in the back of the globe. Um, here's our extra um, section that we often take um, for the globe. All right. So. All right. Two. All right. Um, so here is the front um, of the globe, the cornea here. Uh, we do have some, um, a lot of blood vessels coming in in the mid-corneal stroma here. Um, the globe was uh, pretty pupthalmic um, as well. Um, so probably corneal changes secondary to that. And I'll go ahead and let's go skip all the way to the back of the globe so we can take a look at what that kind of craziness was looking. Um, and it's all of the tissues back here are very um, like hyper eosinophilic and kind of smudgy and pink and homogenous um, and kind of look like they've been fried a little bit. Um, so what we're seeing back here is cautery, cautery artifact from when they removed the globe. Um, the other stuff that is back here, um, here we go. Kind of this component of it though is a little bit of fibrosis, which is obviously a bit more chronic um, than cautery artifact. Um, so <clears throat> we can see um, this episclerofibrosis fibrosis in really bupthalmic globes. Um, and it could indicate um, maybe they had trouble getting the eye out during surgery. And so maybe they resorted to cautery to get the eye um, to come out. Oh, that's total speculation. Um, and you can just see that it kind of um, balled up the like choroid and retina here at the back of the eye. So that sort of answered that question on, on what we were looking at grossly, the back of the eye. As far as to answer their question about whether this was blastomycosis or um, um, something immune mediated, um, <clears throat> as I said, the uvea is, is really thickened. Um, you can sort of see this cellular infiltrate as I get closer. Uh, we do get a loss of some of the pigmented cells on the back of the iris, um, and the iris is infiltrated by lots of macrophages, lymphocytes, plasma cells, um, and a lot of um, melanomacrophages are in here as well. Plasma cells. And this infiltration goes all the way through ciliary body, and into the choroid, so we've got a pan uveitis, again, with kind of a melanophage-rich uh, lymphoplasmacytic um, inflammatory infiltrate here. Um, and you can see some of the free melanin granules peppered around, so some pigment peppering, um, some loss of the melanin granules in the RPE cells. Um, so this is consistent with uh, VKH, or canine uveo dermatological syndrome. Um, didn't see any evidence of an infectious etiology, um, but definitely something immune-mediated. Um, the retina was also detached um, and kind of very atrophied, uh, a little bit difficult to interpret here with all the cautery art artifact, but um, definitely detached and and atrophied somewhat. Um, yes, um, so um, VKH um, uh, most often seen in Arctic breed dogs, um, but we kind of diagnose it in a lot of other breeds here in Copal. Um, when we get them, we often don't have a history of skin involvement, um, but uh, usually the disease progresses. Um, so there's, um, pigment loss um, since the um, pigmented cells is what's being attacked and affected here uh, by the inflammation. Um, and again, it is a bilateral disease, um, usually at the same time. Um, so that sort of fits with the his their history that the other eye 
um, has similar findings um, as, as this one clinically. Um, and again, the corneal changes um, likely due from boopthalmia and exposure um, for that. And then all that wonky cardio artifact, which was just a great learning experience. Cool. A great learning experience. <laughs> Cause I was like, I was like, well, maybe it's Blasto, but <laughs> it was just really weird looking. So. All right. All right. Um, next up um, is a two-year-old golden doodle. <clears throat> Uh, this is the left eye um, that comes with a history of blindness, glaucoma, and corneal edema uh, for about one month uh, duration. Um, the other eye is normal. Um, so grossly, um, the globe was uh, ophthalmic. Um, here's the cornea uh, up top. And here's our lens here. Um, you can see the all this pus um, in the vitreous and this kind of like feathery looking appearance um, to it. It's kind of cool looking. Uh, the retina is detached and we have some subretinal hemorrhages uh, and such. Um, and maybe a little bit thickness um, to the retina um, that's detached um, here as well. So take a look and see what's going on in this younger dog. All right, um, so here is our cornea. Um, you can see that there's some eosinophilic material in the anterior chamber. Um, there's our lens um, that's got some increased cellularity going on around it. Um, so we'll take a look about that. Um, there is our detached retina with our subretinal hemorrhage. And then there's, whoops, sorry. Um, a lot of, again, eosinophilic material and then some um, cellularity um, here in the vitreous uh, that we will take a look at. Here's back of the globe. You can see that there's a little bit of cupping to the optic nerve. Um, nerve head consistent with their glaucoma. Let's take a look here. All right, so I'll head back to the front. Um, here, uh, so do we have a little bit of keratitis and vascularization um, to the corneal stroma? Um, as we start to, um, as we start to move back here, uh, we can see this increased cellularity kind of around the iris. Here was a little bit of hemorrhage uh, within the iris stroma and within this infiltrate. And we can see that it corner, sort of corresponds here uh, with this break in the anterior lens capsule. Um, and so all the cellular infiltrate are a bunch of macrophages and um, neutrophils uh, coming in um, to this lens capsule. You can see some fraying to the ends and um, the inflammatory cells infiltrating in. Um, they are the same cells that are kind of lining um, this fibrovascular membrane that's on the back of the iris. And as we scroll along and looking for the other side of the lens capsule, which is here, you can see that we've got some little friends here sitting out in our lens capsule. Um, so we've got some fungal hyphae um, in the lens capsule um, that's ruptured. Um, they're about five microns in diameter, kind of bulbous um, walls, um, septated, um, didn't really notice uh, very much branching. Um, so we've got a fungal component to this. And let's see, if we keep going back, um, see the inflammation goes around around the lens, um, continues in the back here. 
And then the, the vitreous is um, just a, a sea of eosinophilic material and some degenerate cells, degenerate inflammatory cells. And then let's see. And I don't think it's going to show up very well here. Let's see. Aha. There they are. Got them. You can see sort of these similar going higher. Mm -hmm. Ooh, highlights a little better. Um, so again, we've got fungal hyphae um, in the vitreous as well, um, which I can also show you on a GMS thing because I did that just to help highlight it because they were really, really hard to see. Um, and then similar inflammatory infiltrate, um, macrophages, neutrophils, um, in the vitreous, um, also infiltrating into the retina uh, that was diffusely detached um, and also partially necrotic. Um, didn't see the fungi um, in blood vessels or in the retina itself um, or even in the choroid, um, but that's not necessarily a requirement here. Here, again, just cupping and, and inflammation in the, in the optic nerve. Head there. And then we did a GMS just to sort of highlight the fungus. Um, go back up to the lens capsule. So you can see a little bit. Sensitive. Go. It's not moving. Um, so here, highlighting um, probably even a little bit more uh, fungal hyphae than we were able to see on the H and E in the lens capsule, and then it sort of highlights them a lot better in the vitreous here too. So you can see them. Sometimes, again, they're really hard to see on each and each, um, sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so we've got a fungal vitritis um, here. Um, let's see. Where's that? Everything. Oh, yes. Let's see if I can find this real fast. Um, we did note there was a break in decimase membrane. Um, that was a little bit kind of paraxial, um, so possibly a habstria um, from the bophthalmia, uh, but couldn't rule out, here we go, that there's a traumatic event here. Um, so here's one end of decimase membrane, and then we've got this nice um, like uh, proliferation of spindle cells in between here, um, indicating a, a true break. Um, and again, we're kind of paraxial, um, so habstria from bophthalmia or a traumatic break um, could be either one of those. It's hard to tell um, at this point. Um, so going back here. Um, so there was lens capsule rupture. Um, and I guess I didn't show it very, uh, didn't focus on it, but there was some cataractus to generation of the lens fibers. Um, from that uh, with our pyogranulomatous phacitis and endophthalmitis uh, with our fungal hyphae um, that were in the capsule and in the vitreous. Um, again, those breaks in decimase, uh, that break in decimase either from the habstria, from the stretching of the bophthalmia or a traumatic break, uh, which could, again, with the lens capsule rupture, um, this could be a penetrating trauma that introduced fungus um, into, um, into the globe. <laughs> um, however, we can't rule out that it's not also something systemic. Um, so, uh, did tell them to, you know, just, you know, investigate that clinically to make sure that there's no, uh, fungus elsewhere, um, in the dog. Um, I missed a signal. um, this was a golden doodle, a two-year-old golden doodle female. female from Florida. Okay. So right 
age and gender or systemic disease. Mm -hmm. Sex. Sex. Yeah, sex. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I was, I was going to say, I guess we most commonly diagnose um, as systemic fungal infections in young female German shepherd dogs, but do occasionally see it in other breeds. Um, it's hard to tell morphologically on histo or what um, specific fungus it is, um, maybe an Aspergillus or Fusarium sort of species, but um, there is a nice paper that you really can't definitively tell what the fungus is on histo. And so your best bet is uh, PCR um, or probably culture of the actual tissue um, if there's any fresh stuff that they had. So just a cool fungal vitritis case in a young female dog. And I think that's it. Uh, looks like we're oops, at time. So uh, thanks for joining us and I hope you guys have a great day. Uh, she's coming in on Friday, so if you 